<clears throat> the best news, Song of Solomon. Somebody says, well, I never get anything out of Song of Solomon. Somebody told me that one day. And so we don't read it. We can't read Song of Solomon like a storybook. It's not a story as, as you would normally think of a story where you start at the beginning and you have an ending and you have a lot of interesting things in between. You have to read it kind of like we read Revelation. There's a scene and another scene and another scene. It's kind of like the curtain goes up and comes and we have a scene, and the curtain comes down. The curtain goes up, we have a totally new scene again. And um, so this is Song of Solomon, part two. Now, several weeks ago, we had part one, and I want to just kind of review that just a little bit. And the next time I'm here, why well, it'll be part three. But this is part two of Song of Solomon. In the first scene, the curtain goes up, and we see a young woman, perhaps in her late teens. She's blackened by the sun. She's kind of rejected by her family. She feels like she's been rejected by her family. She's out there working in the hot sun every day. And she just feels terrible because of her appearance, because of the sunburn, perhaps, the sun darkened skin. And uh, she, she feels uh, very uncomfortable. How do you like to pull weeds in the hot sun? Anybody do that? And uh, training vines and you know, out there, and uh, she feels like uh, it's not her vineyard, and you know, been rejected by her family. As she's out there working day by day, day after day, one day, a young shepherd boy comes along with a band of sheep. And um, she goes over to the rock wall, and they begin a conversation. He comes back again the next day. And they get more acquainted, and they're, they're, they're enjoying. Both of them are enjoying the, the encounter. And uh, third day and fourth day, and uh, her heart just throbs for the time when the next day comes so she can be out there in the vineyard. That's the, you know, she's, she's going to meet her friend again. Then one day, the shepherd boy doesn't return. No friend, no sheep. So she grieves terribly about this, and uh, so she leaves the vineyard. And she goes down to the foot of the hill, and she looks where all the shepherds are. And she asks, where's the shepherd boy who brought the sheep up to the top of the hill every day? And uh, they've been cued. And so they direct her downtown, to, down to the town. And somebody down there cues her in again. And she's brought into the presence of King Solomon, a great banquet, all right? A wedding's in store. And her heart just explodes with, uh, with uh, excitement and love for, you know, she didn't know that King Solomon was the one, that was the shepherd boy. We talked a little bit by, about why uh, King Solomon, the, the, the king of Israel, would disguise himself as a shepherd boy and get acquainted with this girl. Why do you suppose he did that? because he wanted her to love him because of who he was, his person rather than his position, right? And you know, it's the same thing with God, isn't it? He wants us to love him. He wants us to love him as a friend. In fact, in John chapter 15, it talks about the friendship. He says, I'm gonna call you my friends. Isn't that neat? So, <clears throat> curtain closes. And it opens again. Uh, you know, in the set that we're about to see is an unfolding of the greatest love story ever told, God's love for his church. That's really what this, this book is about, this Song of Solomon. The curtain opens, we see her in her bedroom this time by a big window. As we look out the window, as we look at, out the window, we see it, it's springtime. The grass is green, the trees are blossoming, and we hear the sound of birds singing everywhere. There's a rap at the window, and it's King Solomon. And he says to her, come away, my love. I'd like to have you turn with me to Song of Solomon, chapter 2. It's right after Ecclesiastes. Uh, 
Song of Solomon, chapter 2. Just a very little book. If you go too fast and you're rustling through the pages, you'll miss it. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 10 to 13. It says, my beloved spoke with me, spoke, and said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And lo, the wind, for lo, the winter has passed, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. We had a turtle here not too long ago at uh, the Autumn Festival, remember that? Did anybody hear, hear him make any noise? They do make a noise. I never heard it, but but there's a noise that they make. I think it means the turtle dove. Turtle dove, okay. Well, in my margin it says turtle dove. Yeah, okay. So um, the fig tree puts forth her green figs, and the vines, and the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Now they're married now. And uh, the king has come. And he's been very, very busy. He probably hasn't shown up a lot. He's got a lot of things to do in his traveling around through the kingdom. He's, so he comes now and he says, and he calls, come away, my love. Do come with me. The marriage has settled down a little bit by now. And the initial excitement has kind of subsided a little bit. And she says, I'm so tired today. I don't know what other excuses she might have had, but why don't you come tomorrow morning? Why don't you come tomorrow morning? <laughs> kind of a sad story, right? And he leaves, and the day passes, and the sun sets, and she's by her, there by herself. You know, every day is a precious day with the one you love. But the first love has slipped a little bit. We read about that, about the Ephesus church, right? In Revelation, the first love has slipped a bit. Never take love for granted. Even the imperfect love, don't take it for granted. It's the best thing we have here. With all the imperfection, look, that's what we have. It's the best that life has to offer. So in the night, she begins to fear. There's insecurity outside of love. I want to say that again. There's insecurity outside of love. And uh, she misses him. Is he going to disown her? That kind of insecurity going through her mind. And now she does a very foolish thing. She goes up, out into the city to look for the king. Let's look at it. Song of Solomon, keep her... Your Bible open to Song of Solomon. We're going to read a few texts from here. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. It says, By night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. I will arise now and go out about the city in the streets in the broadways. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchmen that go about the city found me. To whom I said, saw you him whom my soul loves. She doesn't know at which place he's staying. Evidently, he knows something about her temperament. So he asked the watchman to kind of watch out for her. Uh, they're on the walls. Keep an eye out for her. And so she's wandering around Jerusalem. The watchman comes to her and he cries, and she cries, oh, where is my beloved? And they tell her, and so she finds him. She goes there and finds him. It happens to be near the place where her parents live, near the parents' house. He out there on, he's probably out there on some business, some, some little distance from the city. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 4. It was but a little, it was but a, a little that I passed from them, and I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. So it's easy 
Reason with me a little bit now. It's easy to get tired of Christianity. And in the future, it's going to become very, very unpopular. But that's a love that must be kept alive. It's the best we have right now. Over there, it will be a, seated with him in his throne. Can you imagine that? And all the angels gather. I, I can't begin to imagine. I have not seen, it says. But right now, this is the best we have. However, if we get embroiled in the mechanics of it, it becomes a mechanical religion, a habit religion, and not a heart religion. We want to connect what we know with what we feel, right? With our, with our, uh, our relationship with Jesus. It becomes so easy to lose the meaning of the kingdom of God and turn our religion into a machine instead of, rela instead of a relationship with Jesus. A machine of do's and don'ts. Performance-oriented religion, devoid of the grace and the love of God. Remember when Jesus came? It was one of the things he constantly met. People were making, making an issue about uh, if you washed your hands at the right time or not, or uh, if you kept the Sabbath in such and such a way, if you gave tithe in such and such a way, and uh, do everything right. And yet they, yet they were seeking to kill the Lord of glory, the creator of the universe. Imagine, you get the scene. Motive makes a difference here. The gospel in Christianity is a great motivator. Heart religion. If we know Jesus and begin to spend some time with him, he becomes our friend. And now I'm motivated to love because of grace. Instead, Jesus told them they were like whited, whitewashed gravestones. You're all painted up on the outside and on the inside. You're like dead men's bones. Inside, no real love response to God. Can you see, get the picture? This is a sepulcher here, like a, like a, like a, like a grave. If you've seen a grapevine unwrap its little tendrils, it'll look for a little stick or a little piece of wire someplace, or maybe a, a branch of a nearby tree. Uh, and uh, love that comes from the Holy Spirit reaches out to God often. How often is often? Pray without ceasing, the Bible says. Is it possible to do that? To have our heart in tune with God in such a way that no matter what we're doing, we can have connection with him. Possible to do that? Love is a thing of the heart and is an indicator that there is a spirit, spirited life within. Pray that the Holy Spirit, our scripture reading this morning said, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Pray for the Holy Spirit often. Make that the prayer of your heart that the Holy Spirit will bring daily to us the inner love for Jesus. Love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. If you allow the Holy Spirit, he will give you a heart to know him, Jeremiah 24, 7. Isn't that an interesting idea? He will give us a heart to know him. We can't even conjure this up on our own. God does everything for us. And he gives us that, that ability. Jesus said, to know him is life everlasting. Jesus is our brave, our warm-hearted, courageous Solomon in the Song of Solomon. He's the real love of our life, and knowing him will soften and break our hearts and bring, our, bring to us praise and thanksgiving. By the way, did I say thanksgiving? <laughs> this is Thanksgiving week, right, coming up? All true thanksgiving comes as a result of something that God has done first. I want to say that again. All genuine thanksgiving and praise comes as a result of what God has done first. Amen. It comes there is cause and effect. But it's more than a day once a year that the Lord wants us.
to spend some time with him. If you've heard the birds singing, it isn't always as though they're constantly blowing out air. Sometimes they're inhaling as they sing. Meadowlark is a good example of that. Sometimes they're sucking in air. And we need to have the Holy Spirit come in before we can sing the song of love that God so much wants to hear from us. He wants to hear us say, we love you, Lord. That means something, right? Have you ever had somebody say that to you? Yeah, we like that, right? He's knocking on the door, it says in Revelation 3, verse 20. Knocking on the door. He wants to come in. He's constantly there, wants to come in. The songbirds make such an enormous, joyful sound as they respond to the beautiful morning. And when we observe these things, it helps us to respond to God's love. The flowers respond to the sun. Some of them like the morning glories. Now, up in Idaho, there are morning glories. There are wild ones and there are, there are tame ones. The wild ones are kind of a, a noxious weed up there. But I've seen them in the fields. In the morning when it's still cold or cool, you know, they're kind of clustered together. The petals are together. But as the sun begins to come out, they begin to unfold. And they follow the sun all the way around through the day. Their face is always to the sun. It's an amazing thing. They turn their little heads to the sun. Keep yourself open to the Spirit of God. You know, the Bible says, Thou God seest me, right? He sees us. You know, he saw me get up this morning. He knows me. He knows me. And he knows each one of you in a very, very special way. Turn yourself. Keep yourself open to the Spirit of God all the day long. And when you're tempted to do wrong or say things that are wrong, say a little prayer. Come, Holy Spirit. I need you. Righteousness by faith doesn't start out with a rule book. Rather, it comes as the Spirit of God shows us fresh glimpses of the Lord as we spend time reading his word. Then the do's and don'ts become our joy. We need to be careful we don't get the cart before the horse here, right? And he lights our lives with the, sons, with the son of righteousness. Now I'd like to have you turn in the Bible to Galatians chapter 3. It's very easy for us to get into the Galatian heresy. Galatians chapter 3. It's a false gospel. and The Bible warns us about that. Galatians chapter 3. Verses 1 and 2. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? This only would I learn of you. Received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Well, the Galatian heresy is easy to fall into. We think we're doing all the right things. We, become, we, we, we come to eat all the right things, all the right foods. We practice street, strict health reform. We come to believe this brings more of the Holy Spirit power. And it's really all backwards. So did you receive the Spirit by the works? Did you do the works first and then you receive the Holy Spirit as a result of that? No. Uh, indeed, it's a false gospel. Let's notice on down the page, um, back a couple of pages, I should say, to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And we'll read uh, verses 6 through 12. I marvel at you, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel. From the true gospel that would have been preached to them to another gospel, right? Which is not another, but their be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach uh, any other gospel to you than that you have received, let him be accursed. 
For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me was not after man. For I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of what? Jesus Christ. He went out in the desert. Jesus himself appeared to him, and he begins to teach him the gospel, the gospel of Jesus. The Jews in the book of Acts were crying, circumcision, as if they were all, as if that were the all important thing. We are of the circumcision, they cried, like a badge of honor that you'd wear. But notice what is greater than that. Colossians chapter 2, back um, to, the back, to the right, just a little ways, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 to 15. This is a very key chapter, by the way. I would uh, strongly recommend it as a good Sabbath afternoon read. Colossians chapter 2. We'll start with verse 9. For in him, who is the him here? Jesus. Jesus. For in him dwelleth, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For you are complete in him. Where are we complete? Let me ask that question. In him, not apart from him. We don't receive blessings from him. We receive the blessings in him. Otherwise, we go off on our own way and do our own thing, right? Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 says in verse 3, I think it is, says we receive all spiritual blessings in him, in him. Now you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised. In whom also you are circumcised, in Christ, right? This is a spiritual thing. With the circumcision made without hands in putting, the, in putting off the body of sins by the, of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith in the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him having forgiven all of your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. That was one of the ordinances, by the way, that they were so interested in. These are Christians now in the city of Colossae, which were contrary to us. They took it away out of the way and nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The curtain draws in Song of Solomon. Now we have an absolutely fantastic scene. This is the good news. Okay. This time, it's out there in the desert, close to the rolling hills of home, where she first met Solomon there by the vineyards, out in the desert. And they're going to visit the in-laws. The in-law family are sitting in their cottage overlooking the vineyard when suddenly in the distance there's a cloud of dust beginning to be seen. And uh, you, you couldn't believe what it was. Something so ridiculously extravagant that only a king would think of it. Dust in the desert. What was it? It was a carriage without wheels. A thing people are carried on carried by 60 men, strong soldiers with swords by their sides, carrying this heavy thing with the king and queen on it, walking through the desert. 60 men king carrying the king and his bride, his wife. Handheld carriage, a portable carriage. The base of the thing was made out of gold. The pillars of silver are of silver. Can you imagine how much this thing might have weighed? Take 60 men to carry it along through the desert. The fabric is of heavy purple to keep out the heat of the sun. Sixty men marching across the wilderness and kicking up all kinds of dust and this tiny little town in Israel where the in-laws live. It's approaching. 
And um, anyone looking would say, what is this? Hey, the king is coming to town. As they arrive, there she sits in the fragrance of his perfume, clothed with his money, riding in his procession, protected by his presence, and all the people gather around to see this hometown girl that has done good. Get the picture? And when we all get to heaven, when we all get to heaven, how many of us are going to heaven? Yeah, we shouldn't be hesitant about that, right? When we all get to heaven, nothing will be spared. The angels and heavenly beings will be there rejoicing with us as the caravan from planet Earth moves from this Earth to the Earth, to the, to the, to the planet that we might call heaven where the new Jerusalem is. Approaching with the King of Heaven and his bride. What a wonderful idea that is. I can't hardly wrap my tongue around it. And then they open the drapes so the people can see in, and King Solomon says to her, thou art all fair, my love, yea, there is no spot in you. What an idea that is. Have you ever looked closely at a most perfect flower? The most perfect flower that, that, is, that, that you can find. And you look at the petals. And if you look, look closely, you might need a magnifying glass to do this, but you look closely, you're going to find a little imperfection someplace, right? Nothing perfect on this earth. You'll find a little flaw or speck somewhere on that flower petal somewhere. In the fall of the year, the trees are a brilliant color, absolutely marvelous. They've been through the summer, and now they're turning color. And you say, I'm going to select a leaf here. And you pick the brightest one and the best one that you can find, okay? And what do you find? A little flaw in it someplace, right? Have you ever, have ever, ever done that? Yeah. But here the king looks at her and he says, Thou art all fair, my love. Let's catch, catch up here. It's the Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. It says, Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. Three score valiant men are about it. Of the valiant of Israel, these are the soldiers now, they all, they, they all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night. King Solomon made himself a chariot of wood of Lebanon. He made the pillars thereof of silver and the bottom thereof of gold. The covering of it was purple and the midst thereof being paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem. By the way, who are the daughters of Jerusalem? They're us, aren't they? We're the daughters of Jerusalem if we believe the Bible and we have our faith and trust in him. Go forth, O, go, o you daughters of Zion, and behold the King Solomon with his crown, wherewith, wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals, and in the day of the gladness of his heart. And then verse 1 of the next chapter, Behold, you are fair, my love, behold, you are fair. You have doves' eyes within your locks. Your hair is like a flock of goats that appear from the Mount Gilead. <laughs> I don't know if that feels or not, but, you know, it, it feel, it, it, it's an appealing thing. That's what he's wanting to do here. Now Ephesians chapter 3. Hold your finger here. We're going to come back to this. Ephesians chapter 3. You know, sometimes you might be able to judge what's wrong with the church that Paul wrote a letter to. And... Uh, Ephesians is all about church unity. I kind of wonder if there was some thing, problems going on in Ephesus like in Corinth over church unity. Maybe. Might be a little clue. But notice here, chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. It's not all supposed to stay that way. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hidden in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to make known, I'm sorry, to the intent now, 
that now to principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. <clears throat> what an idea. Now drop over a few pages. It's like a beautiful flower. I want to say this. The manifold wisdom of God. I understand that in the Dutch translation, it is the many colored wisdom of God. That's how the translation reads. And so you see this wonderful flower garden, right? All kinds of uh, tulips and different colors and so forth. And you look at that and your breath's almost taken away because it's so beautiful. But you know, if they were all one color, it probably wouldn't have the same effect. It takes all of us in this church. Every one of us is needed here. None of us is more important than the other one to make this church put on display in the universe and to the people around us, the manifold or many colored wisdom of God. That's what he wants for his church. And uh, like a beautiful flower garden, this is how God looks at his church of justified believers. Some say the church is not important. I've heard that said. I hear that every once in a while. Church is not important. You think church is important? We just read it, didn't we? Let's look at Ephesians 5, 25 to 28, over the, over the page just a little bit. Next page. Ephesians 5, 25 to 28. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having what? Spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Yea, Solomon looks at his bride and says, no spot in thee, wonderful, without spot. That's how God looks at us when we are in Christ. We're talking justification here, right? He looks at us not as people who have sinned and overcome. He doesn't look at us that way. He looks at us as people who never ever sinned. He looks as though we've never sinned. And that's what justification is. When we give our hearts to Jesus in a meaningful way, and our love is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we're sincere, I say a meaningful way. God takes us into himself. And we are in Christ. And is there any spot inside of, him, inside of him? No. You think the father is satisfied with the son? Yeah, we need not worry about what the father thinks about us, but what, what he thinks about Christ, our substitute, right? This is the gospel. Now, I'll tell you what, if we really get it, it'll melt our hearts with so much love that we would rather die than sin. See, it's cause and effect. We want to be careful not to get the cart before the horse. It doesn't work very good that way. We have in Jesus Christ his sinlessness. We are looked upon as being as sinless as Christ himself. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. One of these days, it's going to be physically that way. Not only spiritually, but physically. Let's look at it. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. You all heard this before. Right near the end of the chapter, here's what it says. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has done what? Made herself ready. How do we make ourselves? Is this a works, some kind of a works program? We, we work our fingers to the bone and make ourselves ready? We make ourselves ready by giving our hearts to Jesus. Okay, that's where the horsepower is that pulls the cart. For to, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the what? The righteousness of saints. It's really the righteousness of Christ, isn't it? 
that he imputes and imparts to us who live in that day. And then Psalm, Song of Solomon 6, verse 10. Be our final text today, Song of Solomon 6, verse 10. I should have held my finger there. Song of Solomon, right after Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, 6, verse 10. Who is she that looks forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, terrible as an army with banners? Now, we talked about the clean white linen a little bit a while ago, and I believe this is um, something that I read uh, a long time ago. Clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness. That's the linen, right? Clean and white. Clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness. Fair as a moon, clear as the sun. The church is to enter her final conflict. She is to go forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer. That's what this text says. That's what the inspiration behind this, behind that saying that we love so much. Clad in the armaments of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter her final conflict. Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, terrible as an army of banners, she is to go forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer. This is where victory is. Let's pray, sing this prayer song of praise. My Jesus, I love thee. Let's pray. Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for the wonderful love song that Solomon wrote. For it is, a, it is a sweet verse that helps us realize that we're loved and that our heavenly lover, our great Solomon, is going to come and take us home one of these days soon. I pray that you'll be with each one here today. Lord, we're in the Thanksgiving season. Fill our hearts with praise and thanksgiving. And I pray, Lord, that you will be with each one of us according to our several needs. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.